All right, guys, welcome back to the study of Deuteronomy. Yep, we are back at it with the fifth book of the Pentateuch, the fifth and final book written by Moses. You know, Moses had just delivered uh, the beginning stages of, of his sermon. Think about this. He's talking to all these young Israelites. You know, here he is at the plains of, of Moab. He's sharing this because they're getting ready to go into the promised land. So he's reminding them of, of the battles that they've gone through. He's reminding them of the land that God is giving the Reubenites and the Gadites. And then he's reminding them already of, guess what? Joshua is taken over. And so this is kind of the backdrop as we go into another, you ready for this? Three more chapters on our daily reading. <laughs> That's a lot. So hopefully you guys are giving yourself some more time uh, in reading uh, or listening audio wise, however you guys are doing and hearing from the word of the Lord. But as we get into Deuteronomy 4, just as your quick backdrop, because we're going to teach on Deuteronomy 6, the summary for Deuteronomy 4 is that really in, in the first 40 verses of Deuteronomy 4, it's really an invitation, as one commentator said, to live as wise people. I'm giving you instructions. I'm giving you directions on how you are to live this out. And then at the end of Deuteronomy 4, uh, he talks then again about the cities of refuge. And so just as a general reminder, anybody remember how many cities of refuge there are? Six. Six. Three on the, the east side, the Transjordan side, and three on the Promised Land side. And so here you have these cities of refuge. And he began reiterating about what they are and, uh, and what they do. And then at the end of 44 through 49 of Deuteronomy 4, it's really, again, because we are people that forget things. <laughs> it's like Moses is doing a historical summary again of, hey, by the way, and I like, Rich, what you were saying earlier, like, your parents didn't fully always grasp this, but I want to make sure you understood what I told them, and now I'm telling you as well. And now that transitions into uh, Deuteronomy 5. In the very first five verses, we're getting into the Lord's covenant with his people. And then in verses 6 through 22, the famous, the infamous Ten Commandments. So I think that's really cool. He gets to remind them again about what the Ten Commandments are. Why? Because the Ten Commandments are where? In the ark, right? <laughs> Below the, the mercy seat. And this is what the Kohathites are constantly carrying. Remember, as they're moving from stage to stage, they're carrying the Ten Commandments. And he wants to make sure they understand, because I'll, I'll be honest, I mean, just because the Ten Commandments are the, the, the most prominent thing back then, it doesn't mean everybody knew it. I mean, we have a bad memory. Can you imagine the Israelites out in the wilderness say, what was number eight? <laughs> You know, it's so like the sound, like, let's remind you of what this is. And at the very, very end of 20, uh, verses 23, uh, and at the end of Deuteronomy 5, it really talks about Moses being the mediator between the people and the Israelites. Okay, so that is your, your, uh, your backdrop in Deuteronomy 4 and 5. So let's jump into Deuteronomy 6, verse 1. Now, just so you know, in Israel, if you say you're going to start teaching on and talking about Deuteronomy 6, I promise you it feels like everybody would know this. It's everywhere. I'll get into why and what that means, but this is a very, very important chapter in the Israelites and in the culture today of, of, of the people of Israel. Now think about this, okay? Before we jump into this, Warren Wiersbe says, you know, God gave his law uh, not only to, to, to guide people individually, but also for a nation uh, collectively. Think about this, you guys. They're walking into a system that they need to have some things in place. You know, no longer are they wandering around. They're going to be walking into a place where some things are, it's going to actually feel like a town. It's going to feel like a village. It's going to feel like some things are established. And so there's two million people, you know, that are living together and they're going to have to be fighting together as well. Not against each other, but against the enemy. And they needed what Wearsby said, and I totally agree, and that's what really Deuteronomy 6 does. They needed rules and regulations that were going to govern them. And so, again, what you see with Deuteronomy 6 is this process. The problem was, is that as this continued to unfold with time, yes, even this happened. Deuteronomy 6 began this, this process, or I should say carried on what Moses already instituted. At times, if you're not careful, it could feel like a weight. It could feel like, oh yeah, here's the governance, here's the rules and the regulations. But what happened to us is that over the course of time, religious people were taking these things that were meant for good and they started to place it on people and you just couldn't keep up. And so I just want to give you that, exact, uh, that, that extreme because this is what started and then it went too far. And I'll give you a couple examples in the New Testament in Acts 15 verse 10. Acts 15 10 talks about this, this weight, this mentality. Acts 15 says, now then, why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples' necks 
that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear. Kevin, all joking aside, how many laws do they have to actually live up to? 615? 13. 13. <laughs> Way to go, Rich. It was like, he was so close. He is getting closer. He's getting closer. <laughs> he went from 735 to 615. 613, Kevin. So here's the deal. I don't care who you are. Like, unless you have a photographic memory, and I don't know how this works. I can't even remember how many numbers there are, let alone the laws. It's true, Kevin. <laughs> Apparently he can't count that high. I just, I think, like, to say 10 commandments, you're like, oh, I think I can memorize that. 100, well, okay, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600? At some point, that has to feel overwhelming. And then here's what was happening is, is that the religious folks were taking oral traditions and then they were taking those laws and then adding to those things. And then it was just, it became un, unbearable. And man, Rich, you and I, we've, we've been through the land of Israel. When you go into certain parts of Jerusalem, it is just bottom line depressing. Why? Why, why Rich? Uh, my biggest observation being there is just when you, when you drive around or you walk around, even Old City or just some of the, the streets outside of Old City, is that like you just see the, the Jews... They just, they never smile, they never laugh. You can just see that they carry this weight upon their shoulders. Yeah, it's like they can never live up to what God wants them to do. And in parts of Northern Indiana, I'll be honest, there's a little of that as well. And what I mean by that, there's certain communities that, yes, they understand the scriptures, but when you put more on top of what God intended, it just feels like I can't keep up. I think Christians even do this just generally like, oh, I, I, need, I need to go to church. I need to be a part of Sunday school in the morning. I got to be part of small groups on Wednesday nights. My kids got to get plugged into youth groups. Oh, I got to throw in some VBS. And it's, you almost feel like you have to keep doing in order just to stay up. And I just want to say it, it, wasn't, it wasn't designed like this. Why I'm saying this is, is because when Moses released this, the, the Shema, it wasn't intended to be weight. And I love in Galatians 5.1, it says, Christ has liberated us to be free. Stand firm then and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. Like, we don't have to go back to the old way of doing things. Christ has set us free from that weight. And so it's not dark. It's not heavy. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Like, God is going to use these things. The law is going to use the word to direct us, not weigh us down. Another illustration, and this is where I want to go with Deuteronomy 6, because like this should bring life to us, is that it's a treasure. The Word of God, the law is a treasure. If you want to go to verse, man, you take your pick, there's all kinds. Go to verse 14, Psalm 119, verse 14. And it just says, I rejoice in the way, look at this, revealed by your decrees as much in all riches. Like this is, um, <laughs> like this is a good thing. This isn't a bad thing. And in fact, it also, the law brings about, watch this, go to verse, um, let's go to verse 45, Kevin, if you can. I walk freely in an open place because I seek your precepts. So strangely enough, even within the law, there is freedom when you don't make it legalistic, but you seek, uh, when you seek it. I, I'll get into a little bit more about this in, in the heart condition. So this is kind of the backdrop in walking into Deuteronomy 6. Like this should feel, I got to emphasize this, freeing. And I'm saying that now because I already have been to Jerusalem. I've been to Israel. And what I see with the Shema, what I see in Deuteronomy 6 with the Jewish culture today, I don't see freedom. I just see weight. And so I want to tell you the intention behind this is freedom for people to experience God's presence, to be drawn closer to him. But what we've done is, is that we've made it more about, you know, I got to do this, this and this. And it's not working. And so in Deuteronomy 6, let's talk about what really it was intended for. This is the command. Deuteronomy 6, verse 1, the statutes and ordinances. The Lord your God has instructed me to teach you so that you may follow them in the land you're about to enter and possess. So we're going into a place, guys, I got to put some structure together. <laughs> you know, can you imagine like, it's almost like you take your kids and Rich, you, you know this more than any of us. You know, you send your kids off to college and you hope and you pray that you've instructed them, that you've taught them well enough that when they go into a new land, that they're going to live according to how you've taught them. You know, and I think as a parent and Moses is understanding, I, I really need you guys to get this. <laughs> if you're going to go into this place, I'm not going with you. I really need you to understand this. And it says in verse two, do this so that you may fear the Lord your God. So the law is intended to, to create a fear of the Lord. 
I love this. All the days of your life by keeping all his statutes and commands I'm giving you, your son and your grandson, and so that you may have a long life. You know, this whole long life mentality, like, Kevin, if you would, would you go to, uh, go back to Deuteronomy 4, verse 40. Deuteronomy 4, verse 40, uh, it just kind of has this mentality of, of these are the things that are going to continue to unfold. Uh, so it just says, keep his statutes, commands, which I'm giving you today so that you and your children after you may prosper and that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you for a time. I want to go to one more and then I'll make my point here. Uh, let's go to Deuteronomy 18, verse 5. Again, there's multiple verses within Deuteronomy that talk about prospering and it, how it ties into the law. For the Lord your God has chosen him and his sons from all your tribes to stand and minister in the Lord's name from now on, implying like it's going to continue on. And what I love about all of this, about tying in the law, tying in with, with you know, doing these things, fearing the Lord your God, is I actually believe that you're in the will of God and you walk these things out. So case in point, like if I continue, let's just say I sense that this is what I'm supposed to be doing for the next two years, which I do. But let's just say all of a sudden I decide radically to pull out of it. Let's just say radically I decide to leave everything and I decide radically to go deliver, tr deliver trash. I'm totally serious. I'm not making fun of the trash scenario or anything like that. I'm just saying I just all of a sudden I radically pull out of everything and I just do completely something different. There is a chance, okay, because I heard from the Lord I'm supposed to do this, that if I pull out from this, my life might not last as long as what it was intended. Scripture will prove this, that if you get out of the will of God, your life night might not carry on as long as he intended, because again, you're doing the Reubenites and the Gadites plan, and you're deciding to say, I want to stay in my land, not God's plan. So that's what I love about this prosperity mentality. No, I'm not preaching prosperity, but what the scripture says is that you could have actually a longer life, a prosperous life, if you stay in the will of God. How do you stay in the will of God? You use the law, you use the Shema, you use the, the guidelines that God is keeping, the guardrails to keep you in line. So the second that you get away from that guardrail, it's kind of like, hey, free game. So I just want to encourage us, like, let's continue to function on what we're hearing from the word of the Lord. So in Deuteronomy 6, it just says this. Uh, I think, Kevin, we're in verse 3. Listen, Israel, and be careful to follow them so that you may prosper and multiply greatly. Like, we want to grow because the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. An incredible picture of how, how many times in Genesis did we hear? How many times did we hear in Exodus? Oh, the land is going to be flowing with milk and honey. The land, I mean, it, it's, it's endless. And so again, what's he doing? He's reiterating to the people, maybe they haven't heard it all the time from their fathers. Maybe they haven't always heard from their, their grandfathers. By the way, God has promised since the beginning in Genesis that the place you're going to, is going to be filled with milk and honey. And that's a cool picture. So now he says in verse four, guys, here's the deal. This is what we would call the Shema. And I'll, I'll write it out just so you have a visual for what the word, what the word looks like. Okay. So this is in Deuteronomy 6, 4. You have the Shema, and he says, Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, which means, uh, you know, the Lord alone, okay? That's what there's implying here, is that love the Lord your God. This is the famous verse. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Crazy enough, it was this verse on why I was, uh, it felt confirmed that I was supposed to actually go to seminary. I didn't, I, I have never studied the scriptures like what we're doing today. I didn't grow up like this. Yeah, I grew up in a Christian home, but I started studying the Shema. I didn't even know it was the Shema. <laughs> and I started saying, what would it look like if I loved him with my heart? What would it look like if I loved him with my soul? What would it look like if I loved him with my strength? I had no idea that this was Moses giving a sermon to the Israelites. When you go into the land, this is how I need you to live. And so we know that you guys, we've seen this, but let's just go to some, Jesus quoted this all the time. Matthew 22, verse 37. Uh, Jesus said this, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. Verse 38. Scripture says this is the greatest and most important command. Jesus identifies what Moses releases to all of the Israelites going into the promised land. This is how we're supposed to live our life. Notice he doesn't change it. Notice he doesn't say it's irrelevant anymore. Notice he doesn't say, oh yeah, that's, that was then. No, it's still important. That we love the Lord our God with everything we have. It's also found in Mark 12. It's also found in Luke 10. Like this is, 
over and above like the most uh, important verse we need to embrace. Crazy thing is, it's all throughout the, the New Test or the Old Testament as well. Deuteronomy uh, 11, verse 1. There's a lot here. Therefore, love the Lord your God and always keep his mandate, there it is, and his statutes, ordinances, and commands. Okay, in verse 6, scripture just says this These words that I am giving you today are to be in your heart. You know, it's really hard to meditate on the word night and day if you're not reading the word. <laughs> it's really hard to have love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. It's really ha hard to have that in your heart if you're not spending time with him. And so these words are supposed to be, he says, I'm giving you today, which would imply maybe they never heard it before. I want you to be this. I want this to be in your heart. And so Kevin, if you would go to Deuteronomy 11 verse 18. Deuteronomy verse eight, 11, verse 18 talks about having these things in our heart. Imprint these words of mine on your hearts and your minds. Bind them as a sign on your hands and let them be a symbol on your foreheads. In other words, guys, this needs to be everything of who we are. Psalm 37, verse 31. It has the same mentality of make sure you have this in your heart. Psalm 37, verse 31, the instruction of his God is in his heart. And when that happens, look what happens. His steps don't falter. So when you go into the promised land, if you have the word of God in your heart, there's a good chance your steps aren't going to go this way. Your steps aren't going to falter because you're in line. The word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And it's in our heart. Just one more, Psalm 40, verse 8. Like, I want to be the guy that has revived school that's changed my life because it's on my heart. I delight your, to do your will, Scripture says. My God, your instruction lives within me. Not, not on my notes, not on my board here. This is actually inside of me. That's the game changer of how we're going to see communities change. It has to be inside of us. Kevin, if you would, go to Proverbs 7, verse 3. Proverbs 7, verse 3, again, I just I feel like in understanding the Shema, in order to do the external things, we need to have, Proverbs says, tie them to your fingers <laughs> and then write them on the tablet of your heart. In order to understand the quote unquote um, outside appearance of what we're going to talk about, like it's got to be here first. If it's not on your heart, you know what it is? It's legalistic. And that's when the weight comes in. That's when the, the weight around your neck starts to carry. And you're like, gosh, I, I don't, I don't want to carry this anymore. But when it's here, it's free. Just one more verse just to kind of to prove this. Jeremiah 31, verse 33. Probably one of the classics of all classics. But Jeremiah 31, 33. If you don't have the Shema on your hearts, nothing else works. Now watch. It says, instead, this is the prophet Jeremiah. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. This is, this is awesome. The Lord's declara declaration, I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. Eventually, what the prophet is saying is, is that no longer are you going to be bound to uh, the Old Testament. No longer are you going to be bound to the Torah and, and, and the Tanakh, but it's going to be on your hearts. And I will be their God and they will be my people. There's going to be a shift that's taking place. No longer is it external, it's all here. And what you see in the Shema in Deuteronomy 6 is that he's already saying, guys, you have to have this inside of you. Otherwise, it becomes religious. It's interesting. He wants it on their heart, not in their head. Hmm. Doesn't it say, though, like, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks? Yeah. So, like, if, they're, if their kids don't know this, it's because it's not in their heart? That's right. It's, Absolutely. it's all legalistic right now? Absolutely. So, let, let's just go, man, who knows how far we're going to get today. It's okay. Go to Colossians 3, verse 16. Uh, Colossians 3, verse 16. Like, this should be our mentality of revive school. Let the message about the Messiah dwell richly among you, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, with gratitude in your hearts to God. Like, the Word of God must be inside us. And I love this. It says the message about uh, the Messiah dwell richly. You know, I think some of the reasons people don't share the gospel <laughs> is because we're afraid we don't have anything to say. But we're afraid that we don't have anything to say. This is an extreme statement. It's okay. Because I don't know if the Word of God is inside of us. If the Word of God is inside of us, the Scripture says the Holy Spirit will, will speak through you. Don't worry about what you're going to say. Don't worry about even how it sounds. Trust me. 
been doing 96 of these. Don't worry about how it sounds. <laughs> oh man, you guys, there's so much here. But when you understand, I, the Shema will make no sense unless you understand it's inside of you first. Everything else is external. If it's inside of you, your heart will want to gravitate to the presence of God. And so if you would, Kevin, go to verse uh, 7 of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 6 or 7. So here's the deal. I want you now to repeat them to your children. Okay, so what are we repeating? The words that I've given you today. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. These are the words I want you to repeat to your children. Talk about them. When you sit around the house, when you're just sitting around talking, when you walk along the road, maybe you're going to school, maybe you're going to work. I want you to talk with your kids. And when you lie down, and by the way, when you put them to bed, Hey, by the way, hey, let's talk about this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And then when you get up, I want you to be talking about this. The only way you're going to talk about this though, is if it's in your heart. If you have to walk around holding this, I promise you, you're like, ah, I'm done. But if it's in here, it will, as you said, Taylor, <clears throat> it'll just flow out of your mouth. And in verse 8, Scripture just says this, Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. So here's the deal. The symbol on your forehead is because this is going to sound really dumb. It's a symbol of what's in your heart. Like it's, this isn't the external. This is a representation of what's already here. So these things actually, uh, people do this in Israel today. Jewish people still do this today. So they bind them on your hand. You'll see this. And then it's a symbol on your forehead. This symbol on your forehead is called phylacteries. Okay. I think I, I pronounced that right. They're boxes, okay, literally that contain scripture, okay, uh, when people are praying. Now, inside the phylacteries, inside this box on your head, <laughs> man, it's crazy. Like, uh, like there's going to be a, uh, well, not on this one. These are boxes containing scriptures when they're prayed. Let me get to the verse 9, then I'll get to this one, okay? When, write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates, okay? So now here you have the Masuzilla, Masuzas, Masuza, Masuza. Yeah. Right. It's usually on the right side of the door frame as you're entering a house. That's right. So you're gonna have a Masuza, which is a small vessel, okay, that's attached to the doorpost. In Israel, everybody has this. Okay. Actually, if you're Jewish and you're here in America, you have these. Okay. Inside those boxes, okay, inside the boxes, you're always going to have a small scroll. This is what should be. Okay. It doesn't mean everybody does this because you can buy these that don't have them. You should always have Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9 inside uh, the little box. You should also have Deuteronomy um, uh, and, and verse 11, excuse me. You should also have Deuteronomy 13, verse 21. And you should always have God's name, Shaddai, written on there as well. Okay? These are the verses and the name that you should have in the Masuzah. What, Rich? Masuzahs. You said it right. Masuzahs on your dope horse. This is always a reminder, and I'm just going to say this, of what's on your heart. That's what it comes down to. Whether it's on your door or on your forehead, all of that is obsolete. It's irrelevant if it's not here. And you miss the whole point. Because then you know what you start doing? You start saying, Kevin, where's your box on your head? Or you start saying, Rich, where's your, where's your thing on the door? Like, I'm actually not negating the fact that this is important. What I am getting at is, is that when it becomes about the object rather than about the heart, you've completely missed the point of the Shema. And I think if we're not careful, the church, which we are the church, we have tendencies to be more about the boxes and the masuzas than we do about our heart. And I just think we gotta be careful. I think we gotta be really careful. Because if not, we fall back into the law and there's no freedom there. So scripture just says this in verse 10, when the Lord your God, now th th that's the speech you guys. That's the speech that Moses tells all the Israelites, when you go into the land, when you have this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul and your strength, you're good. Like that's it. And I want you to repeat it all day long, sitting down, walking, standing, eating, everything. I want you to repeat this. This is your DNA. And then in verse 10, it says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he'd give you a land that with large and beautiful cities that you did not build. I like this. <laughs> Houses full of every good thing that you did not fill them with, wells dug that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. And when you eat and are satisfied, Scripture says, be careful 
not to forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Because by the way, when you walk into this place, I'm giving you blessings. If it's not on your heart, it'll become more about you and the external rather than about what the Lord's done. And in verse 13, this is why it's important. Fear Yahweh your God. Worship Him and take your oaths in His name. Do not follow other gods. Scripture continues on in the gods of the peoples around you. In verse 15, for the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God. No more false worship. No more false idols. It's not an option. Otherwise, the Lord your God, He's going to become angry with you and wipe you off of the face of the earth. I probably wouldn't play games. Verse 16, because if you haven't remembered, and uh, he says this, do not, in verse 16, do not test the Lord your God as you tested him at Massa. In other words, remember that there was a time of test. Do not bring about testing. Haven't you already learned? Because when you started testing me over the course of time, Jesus, uh, God even brought plagues at times to people. He's not afraid to wipe out people. <laughs> Carefully observe the commands of the Lord your God, the decrees and the statutes He's commanded you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight so that you, why, may prosper. Carry out the Shema everywhere you go so that you may prosper, so that you may enter and possess the good land that the Lord your God swore to give to your fathers by driving out all of the enemies before you, as the Lord had said. In other words, I am, I'm guaranteeing you prosperity. I'm guaranteeing you blessing in the promised land. Just please love me with everything you got. And then in verse 20, when your son asks you in the future, what is the meaning of the decrees and statutes and ordinances which the Lord our God has commanded you? Verse 21, tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand. And before our eyes, the Lord inflicted great and devastating signs and wonders on Egypt, on Pharaoh and all of his household. And in verse 23, but he brought us here from there, from here to there. I just, I, for some reason, I, I just, I like this. He brought us from there in order to lead us and give us the land that he swore to our fathers. Our God is a faithful God. In verse 24, the Lord commanded us to follow all these statutes and to fear the Lord our God. Why? For our prosperity always and for our preservation as it is today. So it's not just about prosperity. It's about that our people are actually saved for our preservation as it is today. And this is the cool verse. Righteousness will be ours if we're careful to follow every one of these commands before the Lord our God as He has commanded us. Now, that can be a confusing verse. You're like, oh, no. <laughs> Nelson said it this way. Moses didn't offer people a works righteousness by keeping the law. Righteousness, the right relationship with God, God initiates the relationship and then His children respond to it as an expression of love. I like this image that like God is the one initiating this, not the people. And then He says, out of your love for me, the righteousness will actually flow. So here's the bottom line. Christ redeemed us from the weight. He redeemed us from the weight that if we had faith and believe in what He did, that's when righteousness takes place. Please, if you get anything out of this message, don't flip it. It's not righteousness first, then faith. It's faith, then that leads to righteousness. All right, guys, Deuteronomy 4, 5, and 6. We'll talk to you tomorrow.